about uh, a continent uh, that matters to me so much, Africa and the possibility of ending extreme poverty and suffering in Africa. It is a continent that is misunderstood. There are still people who think it's a country. It's not. <laughs> I remember when I first came to school in Delaware, my classmates were always asking me if I slept in a tree and if I fought a lion. Now, I'm the skinniest guy. If I stand before a lion, even if it winks at me, I'm going to fall apart. So that wasn't happening. But Africa is also a land of superhighways and skyscrapers. It's a land where there are extremely wealthy people. In fact, sometimes I give talks to some African students who are so wealthy that what I talk about just seems like it does not exist. Besides the skyscrapers, the gold, the diamonds, in fact, sometimes they joke in Liberia that you could dig in your backyard and find a diamond. I'm still digging my backyard, haven't found one yet. <laughs> so extreme wealth, but behind that, there is also the poverty the extreme poverty. There is obviously poverty everywhere in the world, but the poverty that afflicts so much of Africa is the poverty that kills. There's also the child soldiers. The thousands of children. In Liberia, the youngest was six years old, being forced to fight and being forced to kill in rebel armies. Young people, families, who don't have access to health care. In communities where a young child who's sick will wake up and to get to the nearest hospital will have to walk half a day. And when they get there, there are already thousands of people lining up or hundreds of people lining up to wait in a line while you're sick. And when you eventually get to where you're just about to see the doctor, someone comes out and say, the doctor has seen enough people today. Go back and come tomorrow. And you're sick and you walk the rest of the way home, only to come back the next day. And when you do see the doctor, to be told that we know what you have, but we simply don't have the medicine for you. The millions of people living in slum communities, in very, very poor areas, this photo taken in Freetown a couple of years ago, home to 10,000 people in this community called Crow Bay. In the background, you can see the huts and the makeshift buildings people are living in. But in the middle of this community was water that was running through. It was an open sewer. You can see trash and debris on both sides. What you don't see in this photo is right up the stream, the children who were bathing in this water. It was the same water that was used for drinking and cooking. The woman in the foreground is doing her laundry in this water. The stories of the millions of people living in refugee camps and displaced people centers forced from their homes into communities and places that no human being should have to live in. And then finally, the mothers. The hundreds of thousands of mothers who every day will watch their children die from hunger and disease. Imagine for a moment being a mother with a child, your child, and day after day after day you watch your child go hungry. You watch your tri child get sicker, and there's simply nothing you can do about it. This is the reality for millions of mothers and fathers around the world. But I don't want to spend my talk focusing on just those issues of the starvation and the degradation and the despair. I want to talk about the people who I believe really matter. The women across villages and towns in Africa who are standing up for their rights and, and being involved in local politics and town politics. The young children in refugee camps and displaced people centers who are laughing despite the extreme circumstances they're in and have this longing to learn, to go to school, to be with their friends, to be with the, in the playgrounds. The young women who are working as commercial sex workers, but even if they had an opportunity, a small opportunity to learn a skill or to get a loan to start a business, could transform their lives around. 
the young men, the former child soldiers who were used and abused for so many years, who still have dreams of being doctors, of being engineers, of being architects. And finally, I want to talk about you. Because I believe that changing the world and changing Africa and ending extreme poverty is possible. But it's not about governments. It's not about the UN. It's about you. It's about each person in this room, regardless of age, regardless of where you are on the economic spectrum, believing in yourself that you can do something to impact the world. I've been doing it all my life. Since I was 14, I started my first organization. And the will to do it came from my experiences during the Liberian Civil War. This was me and my mother the year the war started in Liberia. I was nine years old. We never thought we would ever come face to face with starvation or human suffering. And the year the war started, it completely changed our lives around. I remember when the war started, people went out in the streets dancing and singing and celebrating, thinking it would be a grand revolution. I didn't understand politics. I was nine, but hey, I didn't have to go to school that day, so I went out dancing and singing myself. And the war started, and our entire lives changed. We were forced into a refugee camp. The national electric supply was cut off. We had no food, no health care, no water, nothing. People started to die in large numbers. People started to get sick. I remember becoming so sick that I stopped moving, stopped walking. I was just laying on the bare floor in the room that we're staying with, with 18 or 16 other families. And at a certain point, they couldn't feel a pulse, and people said I had died. And they wrapped my body up in the cloth that we were laying on and took my body out and threw me in a heap of dead bodies because they had stopped burying people and were just piling the bodies up. It took my mom, who ran out and went from heap to heap, pile to pile, and shook me up. When they brought me back into the room was when I made the commitment at 10 that I would spend my life working to make change happen. What you're seeing behind me is an actual map of the world. It hasn't been distorted. This map has been distorted to show the presence of the world's wealth. Look at Africa. It becomes a thin line. It almost disappears because the world's GDP is not in Africa. This map has been distorted to show the presence of malaria. It kills millions of people. Malaria, it's a preventable and curable disease. Look at where the deaths are happening. And cholera, a disease that kills 2 million people every single year. People get cholera because they don't have clean drinking water. Look at where those people are dying. If these diseases and if these epidemics were happening in North America or in Europe, malaria and cholera would not be killing so many people. But because it's happening in Africa, and let's face it, because it's Africans who are dying from these preventable diseases, people are hardly watching, people are hardly taking action. Around the world, the cost of making change in the world, most people think it's a utopian dream. But what it would take to change the world is actually not a lot of money. If you look here for providing education for all the kids in the world, it would cost us $6 billion. Water and sanitation, so people would not die from cholera, $9 billion. Basic health and nutrition, $13 billion a year. Remember those figures. And now look at where we spend our money. Perfumes in Europe and the US, we spend $12 billion. There's 150 million children who cannot go to school because we don't want to spend $6 billion, but we can spend $12 billion on perfumes. Pet foods, $17 billion. We spend more feeding our animals than what it would take to provide basic health and nutrition for the world's people. Mind you, I'm not saying don't feed your pets, but this should put it in perspective. Cigarettes in Europe, $50 billion. 
alcoholic drinks, and this is just beer, people, not, just, not even the hard stuff. Just beer, $105 billion, and military spending for just the U.S. alone, $780 billion. That tells us that the money is there, but the willpower is not. We have to change it. A revolution must begin, and it must begin with young people. Every, every single day, the New York Times should be carrying a headline that 30,000 children die today from preventable causes. They're not doing it. Instead, one day you will hear that Paris Hilton lost her chihuahua, and the next day she phoned the damn chihuahua. <laughs> that is not news in the general scheme of things. The news is that people are dying, but we also have the possibility to stop it. I believe that Africa, the hope for Africa that I have is that Africa, there is a soul of Africa. There is hope within the continent. This was a ride I took between Sierra Leone and Liberia. It was a 10-hour journey on bad roads. In that car, people were jammed packing it. Those guys up on top, the four of them, they're not just sitting there just because the car is not moving. Those guys sat up on the car the entire 10 hours. That guy right in front cracked jokes through the entire ride, had me laughing nonstop. Why I show this photo is because in that car and through that 10-hour ride, people were not talking about despair and suicides and killing themselves, but everybody in that car was talking about hope the hope for a new tomorrow, the hope that even if they could live to see the next day, there is a possibility that things could get better, and that is shared across the continent. And I believe that hope will be what rises Africa up. There's great ingenuity happening across the continent. People are taking scraps, ideas, and making things happen to combat their problems. I met one young man in Sierra Leone, never been to school, never had any formal training. From scraps, he had developed a rice cooker. And you could call this rice cooker from a cell phone and it would start cooking. And when the rice was done, it would send a text message back saying, rice is cooked. <laughs> Incredible ingenuity happening in the continent. For young people sometimes think that I can only be a humanitarian to make difference. No, architects, business people, musicians, everybody has a role to play. This is a must-read book designed for the other 90%, which shows practical, easy ways that we can address some of the world's pressing issues. This is one of my favorite photos. It was taken in Rwanda, and I just actually, I'm sorry, it was taken in Uganda uh, two years ago. When we first went there, my organization met this family. It was the mother, father, and six children. Their children had to beg for them to eat. That was the only way they could feed themselves. We gave them a microloan of $200 to start a flower business. Within two years, that business had grown to over $3,000. And when I went back to Uganda, this was one of the daughters greeting me with flowers from their business that had grown so tremendously that the children no longer had to beg. They could now go to school. There are many, many child soldiers who fought, who want to go to school, who would only take as little as $100 to put them to school every single year. It tells us that change can happen. We can have the situation where we no longer have to see images like this, where there's no longer mothers who are watching their children die from hunger. But we have to believe and we have to begin to support the work that's making a difference in real ways. A few months ago, CNN aired a documentary on my organization. It aired to many, many people, but that same day it aired, we only had $400 in our bank account. It was an incredible thing. I was watching Sweet 16 the other day, the birthday show. And it blew me away that someone spent $400,000 on a birthday party. I wish I was there because $400,000 was our budget last year and we could impact 150,000 people. You could stop this if we all stand up, if we all believe. We could transform those images of starving children to the images of children with smiling faces. 
the images of children who are strong and going to school. I leave you with this quote. Our greatest fear is not that we are inadequate, but that we are powerful beyond measure. You are all powerful beyond measure. Thank you.